Okay. Right. Yes, and we are live, Dave. So welcome everyone to the TRT and Hormone Optimization YouTube channel. We are having another live stream today, and this time with our health coach, Dave Lee. Welcome, Dave. Thanks for having me back, Dave, and always good to be here. So um, maybe you want to tell the viewers uh, who you are, what you do uh, first, sort of disclaimer. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, of course, so disclaimer, obviously none of this is medical advice. I am not a doctor, discuss everything said with your doctor. This is not intended to be personal medical advice. Um, so I am a holistic health coach, uh, trained with the Czech Institute, uh, which isn't so much about endocrinology. That's more kind of my personal interest and, and my personal research. Uh, my background is in holistic health as well as neuropsychiatry. Uh, I've got a particular interest in mental health, um, and I've also got a particular interest in I guess what we call like the trouble patients, um, the guys who are kind of mystery cases or, you know, troubleshooting and, and not really getting very far. Uh, they tend to fall into my lap a lot. Um, so yeah, my, and in terms of, you know, TRT and hormone optimization, my interest is in the whole endocrine system. So particularly working with the neurosteroids when they are needed, um, you know, as well as thyroid optimization. And of course, you know, testosterone replacement therapy as well. Right. So I had one question for you from the Facebook group, but maybe I will let you first uh, take the question. A um, bit of a complicated one from uh, Tommy Dunn. Can you see the, the text, uh, Dave? Yeah, I can see it here. So I'm just going to go from the top down. Um, would I be better off moving from every three days to every two days with Sustanon? And would I be better off doing IM instead of current sub-Q into belly fat? So I'm currently on every three days, 50 milligrams of sustenon or 125 milligrams per week. The day I can, I feel great, but the following two days, I could get very agitated or nauseous. My numbers are great. 28 nanomol per liter total testosterone, SHBG 33. I'm assuming that's at trough. Uh, any advice would be appreciated from Dave. Am I best going to every two days instead of every three days? And should I drop sub Q? By the way, does Dave think compounded cream is better uh, compared to sustenon? Uh, no stipulate or an anthate where I am. Yeah, I really understand the situation because a lot of the guys in the UK are in a similar boat. It's basically sustenon, cream, or uh, libido. Um, so the way that I look at sustenon, I mean, in Australia, uh, we actually had a shortage of primatestin, which is like our version of an anthate. So we all had to use sustenon for like over a year. Um, so we all kind of got some like in-depth experience with it. And, you know, I got a lot of experience coaching guys on it. Because of the short-acting esters in sustenon, the propionate and the phenylpropionate, some guys need to pin it daily uh, because you're going to be getting like a spike of the short esters and then you're going to be getting a spike of the long esters. And sustenon was basically a marketing ploy to be able to patent an injectable form of testosterone. Uh, it was marketed to be superior to enanthate because it's got four different esters. I mean, it's just fucking stupid. It's, uh, it's, it's something that is hit or miss with a lot of people. For a lot of the guys in Australia, they just followed their regular anathate or cipionet protocol. So if they were doing twice a week, three times a week, they just stuck to that. But some guys did get a bit of a roller coaster effect. So in terms of what I saw with Sustanon, like because of those long acting esters, sometimes it just needs a bit more time to settle in. Uh, but for me personally, I needed to pin Sustanon daily to feel good on it. And I honestly think, particularly if sustenone is coming in ampules and they're a pain to deal with for daily injections, I just go for cream, to be honest. Um, I think you're going to get less messing around with the cream, particularly if you can get like a good compound of 20% cream. I would go for that over sustenone personally, um, as I think that's just a better option. But I, I don't think like sustenone is just, if, if those ampules are just, have you used the ampules before? They're a nightmare. Oh, sorry, mate, you've muted your microphone. Uh, Stephen, you're on, you're on mute. You've got your microphone muted. Oh, sorry, Dave. <laughs> yeah, right. So, yeah, I, I shortly, three years ago, uh, used sustenon because that was also the only thing we have in Belgium here next to the cream that I've been using since. And, yeah. yeah, that was really annoying because, yeah, you have to break these ampules, maybe fill several syringes up uh, in advance, uh, not the most hygienic thing to do. So 
Yeah, it's very annoying. So it is recommended on the leaflet from Sustenant to inject the whole thing once every two or three weeks. But yeah, as we all know, that's not really the, the best thing to do to get uh, stabilized level levels. Yeah. So yeah, for, for this guy, I'd say either do daily pins with your Sustenant, do like a shallow intramuscular injection um, or go for the cream. But if it was me and they were my only two choices, I'd go with the cream 100%. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I've been using the cream 20% compounded uh, transcrotal uh, ever since. I had to, I have great um, symptom resolution and levels on it. So, uh, yeah, yeah, if it's sustenance or cream, maybe choose the cream. Yeah, for sure. Okay, so uh, another question was uh, from Moreno, uh, who also says, Dave, uh, lower your speaker volume, hard to hear. Uh, he cool. asks, how to minimize anxiety when starting TRT? Ooh, that's a that's a tricky one because anxiety is a very multifactorial issue, uh, particularly when it's testosterone related. Um, if you had pre-existing anxiety before going on testosterone, uh, it may be something that you're going to need to look into kind of elsewhere in terms of, you know, looking at stuff like mindfulness and meditation, cognitive behavioral therapy, and so on. But if we're talking about like testosterone replacement alone, and this is causing you some issues, then the stuff that I'd be looking into firstly is like magnesium glycinate. We do know that testosterone depletes magnesium at a higher rate. So the more testosterone you have, the higher your basal requirements are going to be for magnesium. So I, I like magnesium glycinate before bed, four to 500 milligrams tends to do pretty well. Um, and then what I'd be doing as well, like if, if you are getting anxiety from starting TRT, assuming that you're not using HCG, which can be another culprit for triggering anxiety, um, it would just be about increasing your injection frequency. And for a lot of guys, when you do start testosterone, it can be a little bit overstimulating. Uh, it can activate the central nervous system a little bit more than they're used to. So a lot of the times you just need to ride it out. And depending on, you know, we can all experience different things that we call anxiety, but what I would be encouraging this person to do is more cardiovascular exercise as well. Exercise the body, move more, uh, can often really help to tire the body out, particularly to prepare you for sleep um, and just let the body adjust. You know, it is a big adjustment to go from hypogonadal to optimal testosterone levels. And I think going for, you know, more frequent administration, uh, using supportive supplements can be really helpful as well. And my favorite supplement for reducing anxiety and stress in general is called PM Primer by Supplement Needs. It's a very high dose blend of phosphatidylserine, uh, which reduces cortisol uh, with L-theanine and you take it before bed. Uh, and that can be very, very helpful. And that's been very helpful for a lot of my guys. Mm -hmm. Another question, Dave, um, low fat or low carb for weight loss? I know you can do both, of course, uh, uh, as long as you have a low calorie intake, but wh what's your preference? Me personally, I mean, I actually prefer lower fat, honestly, because I find that like the high fat, low carb approach messes with my performance too much. And for me, I find that the biggest leverage in fat loss is activity. Um, I find that, you know, doing more physical activity is more helpful for me. Like, I mean, obviously it's just calories in, calories out equation, but I find that if I go like high fat or if I try to drop my calories too much, my performance really suffers. Uh, so I actually prefer to increase activity levels. And I find that a higher carbohydrate, lower fat approach for me uh, is better as, as an anti-stress approach. And it also helps me fuel performance a lot better. So that's my preference, but we're all kind of wired a bit differently in terms of what energy macronutrients work better for us in terms of like our metabolic furnace in the body. So, you know, if you're feeling like, uh, you know, more like less satiated, more hungry on like a high carb, low fat diet, then maybe you want to swap over and see how you go. Some guys do incredibly well on a low carb diet. And if, if you do want to follow a low carb approach, um, I would encourage you not to go for like a super strict keto approach uh, because deep ketosis long-term is very stressful on the body. You want to go for a bit more protein cycle in and out and also use carbohydrates strategically around workouts. Uh, Mark Sisson's primal blueprint is a pretty good blueprint to follow for like a lower carbohydrate approach. Uh, but yeah, it, it's going to really depend on the individual. But for me personally, I prefer to optimize thyroid function and then go for a higher carb diet to fuel performance and get more exercise in like the different, like adding in daily cardio, uh, is such an over overlooked approach for a lot of guys. 
and you know getting extra steps in or just chucking in a few extra cardio sessions a week can make a huge difference in weight loss. Mm, agree. Ali Gilbert. Hi, Ali. Uh, she says, uh, if I inject my test probe in my face, will I get a beard like yours? I want to stay as feminine looking as Gil. <laughs> so please advise. I hear facial injection helps me look younger. Yeah, absolutely. So Ali, for you personally, I would say inject your test prop and do like one, like split your injection into each cheek and then do like a topical testosterone cream as well. Um, and then send me some photos after a couple of weeks and, and let's see how that beard's coming along because I reckon I reckon you'd look pretty good with a beard. <laughs> okay, another question, a uh, serious one. If 150 milligram transcrotal cream daily is too much and 100 milligrams too little, Can you do 100 milligrams scrotal and 50 milligrams inner thigh to get somewhere in between? Yeah, I've seen a lot of guys doing this. Like they'll go for like a transcrotal and then like mixing it in like inner elbow or like back of the knee, um, inner bicep, all that kind of stuff. I mean, yeah, you can, but I think it's really going to overcomplicate a lot of things that don't need to be overcomplicated. I would be modulating the dose. Um, And I, I would be wanting to have a look at the labs in terms of like what a lot of the guys do who do cream when you're troubleshooting. I think if, if you're just dialing in a cream dose and everything's going pretty well, you can either measure peak or trough depending on what your provider wants to do and you could dial it in that way. But I think if you're troubleshooting like this, you'd be best measuring like a six hour peak and then like a 12 hour trough and actually seeing where that, where that curve is and then adjusting from there. But What I'd be doing is I'd be changing the concentration of the cream so that you could modulate the dose that way. Because I think trans, like when you start to mess with different application sites, it's going to create too many variables. I think stick to one application site. We know that transcrotal is by far superior and then modulate your dose that way. So, you know, get a different dispenser or, or change the concentration so that you can change your dosage, dosage around a little bit. But I wouldn't be going for multiple cream sites. I think that's, it's kind of like combining the cream with the injections. It's just overcomplicating where it's just not really needed. Yeah. Um, seven keto DHEA versus DHEA. So um, Sid Larry says, if 7-Keto doesn't increase your hormone levels, wouldn't be better to take 7-Keto DHEA instead of regular? Explain the pros and cons of both and which one you recommend. Yeah, sure. So 7-Keto uh, DHEA is garbage. Um, you'll find that 7-Keto DHEA is very heavily marketed in countries where it's illegal to sell DHEA over the counter because it's scheduled so that it allows them to actually sell a supplement that they can market and just sell online or whatever without a prescription. So 7-Keto DHEA is a metabolite of DHEA that doesn't have any hormonal activity, and it hasn't really been shown to be very effective for doing much of anything. What it arguably does is it does increase... Uh, the uh, metabolic rate of the body slightly. So people market it for fat loss, but where it really gets misconstrued is people say, well, you can get the benefits of DHEA without the side effects of DHEA. And it doesn't, it doesn't work like that. That's like saying like you can use Clomid to get the benefits of testosterone without the side effects of testosterone. It doesn't work. Um, so seven keto DHEA, It just doesn't do anything uh, beneficial. I've had guys supplement with it. No one has ever noticed anything from DHEA, uh, 7 keto DHEA. But at the end of the day, if you have low levels of DHEA, you need to optimize them. And if you don't have low levels of DHEA and you don't have low DHEA symptoms, I wouldn't be messing around with any of it. Uh, it's it's just not needed. So. If you're having issues with DHEA and you do have low DHEA levels and you're wondering if 7-keto might give you like less side effects or if it might be a better option, it's not. You just need to alter your dose of your DHEA and it's important to get blood work. I think the big mistake that guys make with DHEA is particularly like in the States where it's over the counter, they treat it just like a supplement. They just whack it in and see what happens. But treat DHEA just like you treat your testosterone. You dial in your levels, uh, you, you know, you optimize, you, you, you make a change, you wait four to six weeks, you test your levels and you adjust from there. Uh, don't just play around with these willy nilly, but yeah, seven keto DHEA is a complete waste of time. The pros of DHEA, if you have low DHEA levels, DHEA is an extremely potent antidepressant. It is also stimulating. It shares a lot of mechanisms with caffeine. Uh, so it, it can be energizing. 
and it can also increase the sensitivity of the penis as well. So guys who are having issues reaching, um, reaching ejaculation or having satisfying orgasms uh, can often find that DHEA is very pro-libido, very pro-arousal, uh, and it can also help with your metabolism. It can help with insulin sensitivity. It does a lot of really cool stuff in the body, but we only want to supplement with it if it is low, because if it's not low and you add too much on and you take your levels too high, you're going to be overstimulated. You're going to get side effects. You're going to sweat like a motherfucker and you're going to get pimples as well. So uh, yeah, seven kilo DHEA, total waste of time. An add-on question from uh, Sid Larry. Do you like DHEA levels 300 to 500? All right, this is using uh, the US units. Yeah, absolutely. So in terms of the, the ceiling for DHEA, I mean, I have taken some guides up a little bit higher than that, up to what I believe would be 600 to potentially even seven or 800 in those units. Uh, but that has been particularly for treating uh, treatment resistant depression and they weren't getting side effects from it. In terms of DHEA, you want it, you actually want it in the middle. So there's this misconception and I'm, I'm not going to name names, uh, but a lot of people look at this hormone and go, okay, well, DHEA has X, Y, and Z benefits. So the more DHEA you have, the more benefits you're going to get. And it doesn't work like that. It's not that simple. And I think when you understand endocrinology and you understand the balance of the hormones in the body, it just doesn't make any sense. Um, so DHEA is very much a sweet spot. And what it has is called an inverse U-shaped response. I go through this in my lecture where if you imagine like an upside down U, uh, you actually want to be in the middle where too much is actually just as bad as too little. It's just different kind of negative side effects. So it's the difference between being understimulated versus overstimulated. The difference between no coffee and 20 cups of coffee. Um, so in, in terms of where levels best sit, it really depends on the individual. But 300, I would say, is about the floor. Like some guys can be getting symptoms in like the 250, even low 300 range. But it really depends on what's going on with the individual, how old they are as well uh, is also a big factor with this. But I'd say levels between three and 500, I wouldn't even be thinking about supplementing with DHEA. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, for the viewers, uh, don't forget on our... Um... YouTube channel homepage, uh, Dave already made uh, two lectures on DHEA and pregnenolone, part one and part two. You just type in um, the looking glass DHEA and you will find them um, more than 45 minutes, uh, I guess, uh, lectures on pregnenolone and DHEA. Uh, very nice presentations. So um, something else. Uh, do you have experience with TRT with uh, people suffering from bipolar? What is the correct frequency in order not to cause mania? Right. So bipolar is a tricky one because, well, firstly, there's two types of bipolar. You've got what we call traditional bipolar, which is episodes of mania and episodes of depression. And then there's also second type bipolar. It's got different names, but it's basically bipolar. But you don't get the mania. You just get the lulls of depression. Um, so in terms of testosterone relating to bipolar, there isn't really any mechanism for interplay between the two. So I would say that super physiological levels of testosterone could potentially cause mania in anyone, uh, but particularly if you are predisposed to, to something like bipolar. So if you are predisposed to manic episodes, you really want to avoid the peaks. So I would be going for as much frequency administration as you could be bothered doing. I would say daily injections would be very good or daily administration of cream. I definitely wouldn't be doing weekly injections. And what you want to do with bipolar is you want to keep yourself as steady as possible. Uh, and if you're particularly worried about triggering mania, I'd be looking at the research relating to CBD oil for bipolar. Uh, I'm not saying that it's a panacea for bipolar, but there is some really interesting research in terms of mania and uh, and CBD oil. But yeah, you want to be going for as frequent injections as possible, uh, and you want to be avoiding those those big peaks, which could potentially uh, be exacerbating mania. But I wouldn't really be saying it would be triggering it, but it could be exacerbating something for sure. Yeah, we already have a lecture from Dave as well on the CBD oil on the channel's homepage. So uh, use the search function uh, with the looking glass, type in CBD, you will find uh, Dave's lecture on that one. So um, having a look, I'm in Australia and my dad has the worst grade of liver failure. Will GHRP6 help regenerate it? You see the question oh. from Trader. 
So, and I'll also just go back to the bipolar one quickly. I'd also check your pregnenolone and progesterone levels as well for, for bipolar. It's worth having a look at those. Um, so, GHRP6, I'm not a fan of in general. Um, I'm not really a fan of, of GHRP6 as a uh, growth hormone releasing peptide. I think you're much better using something like ipamorelin. Uh, I think that's just a better option in, in general, or if you can get access to it. And if you're in Australia, you can, uh, it would just be actually using growth hormone. Uh, it's just got a, a much, much cleaner and more precise mechanism of action. In terms of regenerating the liver, if you've got worst grade liver failure, I mean, using a growth hormone uh, supplement, whether it's actual growth hormone or a secretagogue, would definitely help. But you, you, what you want to do is you want to hit multiple angles of, of regeneration and health with the liver. So what I'd be looking at would be, uh, you know, using something like BPC-157, uh, potentially also something like TB-500 in conjunction uh, you could be using it morelin as well. And then you want to be using other supplements which have shown to help the health of the liver. So it would be desiccated liver, something like Tudka and Acatel cysteine, and even the botanicals like milk thistle and curcumin. But if you're at worst stage liver failure, I mean, this stuff might all be a little bit too late. So it would be stuff that, yeah, it could potentially help, absolutely. But will these peptides and will these supplements help with advanced stage liver failure? It really depends on the individual, and that's definitely something you'd want to talk to your liver specialist about for sure. Maureen, you also asked, um, how long does it take for your body to shut down testosterone when starting TRT? So should you start with a lower dose until your own production shuts down? As far as I'm aware, it shuts down pretty fucking quick. Um, and I, I don't really think that, that is part of the equation of what a lot of the stuff goes on about. I mean, if I if you got shut down instantly, then obviously you're still going to have testosterone in your body that's going to be bound up. It's going to have a half life. But I, I would say that the, the shutdown is going to be very quick in terms of shutting down that luteinizing hormone signal to the testes. How long the testes will continue to function and produce testosterone afterwards? Who knows? I don't think it matters too much. The issue when someone is starting uh, testosterone in terms of, I mean, should you lower your dose until your natural production shuts down? No, because what's going on is that when you're using something like, let's say you're using, assuming you're using testosterone enanthate or cypionate, like most of us are using, if you're doing injectables, it takes a long time for those, those half-lives to bank in the body. So naturally your levels are going to climb over about four to six weeks because you're stacking half-lives on top of each other. So you're injecting before the testosterone has completely been eliminated from the body. So your levels are going to rise and rise and rise and rise. So you're already kind of easing yourself into treatment. The issue that some people have when they start testosterone, some people think it's great. It's a honeymoon. Other people get uh, exacerbated, anxious, and overstimulated. I think is due to increased dopaminergic transmission because when you have high levels of androgens, you have high levels of dopamine transmission. So your body needs to adjust to that. Your body and your brain, before you do your first testosterone injection, don't know that that big dose of testosterone is coming. And if your body has adjusted and has built itself and your neurology around having low testosterone levels, and then you start and initiate testosterone treatment, you're going to need to adjust to that. Similar to if you've never had a cup of coffee and you start drinking coffee every day, those effects are going to change over time as your body gets used to it and achieves this balance that we call homeostasis. So I think when you're starting testosterone replacement, you should just be starting on what would be considered a modest dose. Uh, some providers would start at 100, some providers would start at 150. Depending on your binding levels of proteins, they could even be starting a bit higher than that, depending on what's going on with the individual, and then just titrating accordingly. So getting your blood work checked early is important. I check it at four to six weeks, other providers check it at eight to 12 weeks, but adjusting your levels. But I don't really think that the, uh, the, the, the potential delayed shutdown of endogenous production, if it is a factor, would be worth considering for your starting levels of testosterone. Mm -hmm. The question I had uh, from the Facebook group, uh, I already saw you uh, answered a bit, but I, might, uh, I thought it might be interesting uh, to have you talk about it here. Is there a kind of correlation between our uh, famous coronavirus infection and testosterone levels? Are people with low T more prone uh, to infection in general, maybe? And uh, so is TRT uh, protecting or stimulating immunity? Right. 
it's it's really hard to say because I don't think anyone's ever going to do a study on that. Like particularly looking at like uh, the beneficial uh, the, the benefits of antigen treatment for preventing coronavirus. No one is ever going to fund that study ever. Um, it would be amazing if they did. Um, what I have seen anecdotally is I've seen the guys who are on cycle, like guys who use super physiological levels, get absolutely wrecked by COVID. Um, like I've had guys mid cycle who like couldn't get up off the floor. Um, just completely, literally floored by this stuff. Because when you go into super physiological territory of antigens, you can suppress some immune function, you can you can suppress glucocorticoid steroid activation, uh, and that's when you can start to run into some issues. But assuming that we're talking about TRT and we're talking about the difference between like hypogonadism and then optimal male testosterone levels, um, I would be saying that the testosterone would be supporting and strengthening your immune function, uh, and it would also be making the body more resilient. I think that when you have low, we know that when you have low testosterone levels, your body is more prone to inflammation, your immune system is weaker, you have other inflammatory issues going on. So I would be saying that using testosterone replacement should be, uh, it's definitely not like a bulletproof vest for COVID, of course not. But I'd be saying that you'd be in a better position being on TRT than you would be if you were hypergonadal and not being on TRT if you contracted COVID. But of course, there is going to be so many other factors that would be at play in terms of someone's outcomes. Okay, thank you, Dave. To get back to the DHEA for a moment, to check DHEA levels in serum, is it best to test for DHEA or DHEA-S or are both needed? We've never been able to run a regular DHEA panel. We've only ever been able to check DHEAS uh, in labs that I've worked with. So when we talk about DHEA levels, we're generally talking about DHEAS in terms of when we're talking about numbers and when we're talking about doing it in general. And DHEAS is DHEA sulfate. Uh, pregnenolone also has pregnenolone S, which is pregnenolone sulfate. So what happens is when your body creates DHEA or when you take a DHEA supplement by whatever means, your body will then convert it into a sulfated form. And you can. this does have actually different biological functions, but you can kind of think of it like a reservoir because the DHEA sulfate has a much longer half-life. DHEA has a half-life of like 10 minutes, uh, but DHEA sulfate has a half-life of about 10 hours. So what the body does is it converts it into the sulfated form and then it can pull it back into the unsulfated form as needed. So it's quite a complex process. So what you want to do is when you're checking for anything in serum, you want to check for the thing that has the longest half-life because it's going to have the most stable levels. It's like checking growth hormone. Growth hormone has a ridiculously short half-life. So unless you've just administered an exogenous form, the meaning is going to be redundant. Like if you checked your regular DHEA levels at five points throughout the day, you're going to be all over the place. It's not going to be consistent. So you definitely want to check the sulfated form when you're doing DHEA or pregnenolone. Okay. That's clear. Um, what, what dose of NPP with TRT for shoulder pain uh, without side effects? Right. Uh, as far as I'm aware, NPP is not approved uh, anywhere for medical use. So I'm, I'm going to assume we're talking about mandrolone decanoate here, which is approved, of course. Uh, but I prefer to go for the minimal effective dose when it comes to nandrolone, whether it's NPP or DECA. Um, and this is just based on the studies for protection. This is this is basically going for the do no harm, minimal effective dose. So uh, DECA was originally, I believe it was either in 25 or 50 milligram ampules per mil. Uh, and people were using one ampule every two to three weeks. So in terms of the dosing that I like to use when I initiate DECA with any of my clients for injuries, I start them on between 12.5 and 25 milligrams a week, which is very, very low compared. Like I, I've seen, you know, anecdotes of guys in groups or on Reddit being like, yeah, I just whacked in a low dose of nandrolone to my TRT protocol. I'm just doing hundred milligrams a week. And that's like two to two to four times the dose that has been studied to be proven to be effective, but also to be proven safe. So nandrolone does have cardiovascular risks when you go into higher dose territory, and I've also seen due to the uh, progesterone receptor binding effects of nandrolone that it can cause some mental side effects. Like I have seen it very, very rampantly in my clients, guys getting issues with mood, guys getting issues with libido. Uh, guys generally find that if they use too much DECA, 
it kind of takes away a lot of the androgenic masculinizing effects of testosterone. So you want to be using the minimal effective dose. So because it's, I mean, I know that we do make very trace amounts of nandrolone, so it is technically bioidentical, but in the context of this dose, it's not a bioidentical hormone. So I think you're best using the minimal effective dose and then titrating up. Uh, if you need to take more. So I don't have any guys who use more than 25 milligrams of nandrolone a week, uh, whether it's the form of it, MPP or in Okay, very tiny amounts. So MPP has to be uh, injected daily. So uh, I guess if you have uh, 25 uh, divided by seven, so that's very little. Yeah, tiny, tiny little bit in, in the syringe for doing a daily injection. Some guys can get away with doing MPP every other day. Uh, but yeah, you're, you're going to be using very, very small amounts. But MPP is also like 100 milligrams per mil, so it should be a bit easier to do the microdosing. Okay. What would be the best way to increase iron for those with gastrointestinal issues? My ferritin is at two. Jesus, that's low. Uh, well, it would depend on the gastrointestinal issues that you're having, but what you definitely want to avoid would be non-heme iron versions of iron, which is pretty much like most iron supplements that are sold. Um, I like to use, for men, uh, assuming that this is a dude, I like to use desiccated liver uh, to increase iron because it also contains copper, uh, which helps with iron absorption. Um, I think a lot of the time going in with just too much iron, you have to look at the cofactors for uh, you know, restoring and preventing anemia. And I think using between you know four to six capsules of desiccated beef liver is a good start to see how you tolerate it. Particularly if you've got gastrointestinal issues, you should still be able to absorb and assimilate uh, desiccated beef liver because it is very easy to digest. Uh, if that is not working for you, you could go with a heme iron supplement. My preferred one is called Proferrin. Uh, this is also an extremely bioavailable form of iron, but heme iron is the version that you get from eating red meat. You get it from drinking blood. It, it, is, the, it is the most bioavailable form of iron that we can supplement with. And you can buy Proferrin off Amazon. If both of those fail, and it would really depend on the gastrointestinal issues that we're dealing with here, then you could be looking at iron infusions because obviously you don't need to digest that. Uh, but you want to be very careful with iron infusions that you're not taking your levels too high uh, because as men don't menstruate, we don't naturally lose blood every month. So if you do take your iron levels up too high, you can kind of run into issues on the other end of the spectrum. So yeah, I'd be starting with desiccated beef for the first, heme iron second, and then if both of those fail, then I'd be going for an iron infusion. Okay, right. Why do some men have poor conversion to DHT on injections? Have you seen this yourself? Uh, yeah, so basically conversion to DHT is, I'll also add as well, just for the previous gentleman, uh, my preferred uh, desiccated beef liver is uh, called Nutriest, N-U-T-R-I-E-S-T, and it's made up here in Estonia. Um, very, very good value, very, very good products. You can even get a powder as well. Um, other forms of beef liver can be very expensive. Um, so in terms of the conversion to DHT, it is mediated by the 5-alpha reductase enzyme. Um, now, so naturally, genetically, some people do have lower levels of 5-alpha reductase to begin with. So that's going to do it you know, to, to start. Secondly, there are many things in the diet and there are many things in lifestyle that can mess with your levels of 5-alpha reductase. Uh, so particularly people who have a history of using SSRI medications or are using SSRI medications, I have seen that reduce 5-alpha reductase. Uh, but what is very well known is all the things that people use for hair loss. So the big one obviously being finasteride, uh, but also stuff like minoxidil, uh, ketoconazole, and even tea tree oil and other topicals can also systemically reduce 5-alpha reductase. But what I found is that it tends to be guys who kind of have low 5-alpha reductase levels in the first place, and then that they're very uh, sensitive to that kind of smaller reduction. So that's what I've seen. It's either genetic or it is induced. Obviously, having a poor diet, high levels of inflammation, micronutrient imbalances and deficiencies will also cause issues with that. Uh, but yeah, some guys do have low levels of DHT. And this, we basically, there's, there's a couple of ways to mediate this. One is by using a transcrotal cream, uh, and that often really helps. Uh, another option is to increase the dose. 
um, and that could often bring DHT levels up and resolve symptoms. And the other one, depending on what country you would be in, would be using something like Proviron at 25 to 50 milligrams per day, uh, but that's getting into the non-bioidenticals. The issue with stuff like Proviron is, yes, it does act a lot like DHT, it's a DHT analog, it doesn't metabolize into the neurosteroid metabolites of DHT. So the versions of, uh, you know, whether it's Proviron or Masteron or Anavar or all these different DHT analogs, they're never going to quite be as good as the real thing, but they're also better than nothing. Right. So um, another question I had in the messenger, uh, I know Jeffrey Rutherbush already talked about Boron. But um, in what case would you recommend boron next to TRT uh, for everyone or only when um, the, free T uh, the free testosterone is low? I think everyone should be supplementing with a really good bioavailable multivitamin. Uh, and a good multivitamin should contain at least three milligrams of boron. Um, three milligrams. Yeah. yeah, I think three milligrams of boron is, is what everyone should be supplementing with. The, the issue with getting minerals from the diet is unless you're eating like an organic ecological diet, uh, a lot of these sources of these minerals, because the crops are not rotated and fertilized properly, like we think we're getting a certain amount of minerals and vitamins when we plug it into chronometer, cr chronometer uh, but in reality, we're not getting anywhere near that amount of minerals just because of monocropping and issues with agriculture. So a lot of the time people can be deficient in these minerals, particularly minerals like boron. Uh, and boron has some very cool effects on the body. I have seen people recommending supplementing up to 10 milligrams a day of boron. I don't think there's any harm in doing that, particularly if you've got high SHBG, you've got low free testosterone, and you haven't tried increasing your intake of boron. I think that's a very good place to start because it's an essential mineral for the body. But I absolutely do recommend people supplement with a bioavailable, really good quality multivitamin. The issue with a lot of multivitamins is that they're just cheap garbage and they're not absorbed. They're, they're crappy forms. The doses are insufficient. So the, there's three brands I recommend for multivitamins. One is by a brand called Supplement Needs in the UK. They make a very good multivitamin. Uh, the other one is Thorn Basic Nutrients. Very, very good product. And the other one is the life extension two per day multivitamin. They all have three milligrams of boron per serve. Okay, excellent. Um, Chris D says, I started TRT four weeks ago, 100 milligrams twice a week, no other supplements. My testicles hurt a bit and my erection is not as strong as it was. Should I change anything? Okay, so what I would be doing at this stage, because you started four weeks ago, is just keep doing what you're doing until you get your blood work done. Because there's probably a, there's there's probably going to be things that you're going to want to change for sure, but we don't know what they are. And if you make a blind change now, you're going to need to wait another six to eight weeks before your levels you know stable out. So you're better off just doing what you're doing for another couple of weeks, having your first blood review with your practitioner, and then that way they can work out what's going on. But what I'd be assuming would be either uh, your levels are too high or they're too low. Uh, or you need to be injecting more frequently, uh, or you could have deficiencies elsewhere. So you could be having deficiencies in DHEA, uh, you could be having deficiencies in your thyroid elsewhere. Or the other thing is that, you know, you're only four weeks in. So as I mentioned before, testosterone takes time to build up in the body. And a lot of the sexual benefits and the, the libido benefits as well, I really see popping up at like the 12 to 16 week mark. So it might just be a result of giving it time. If you do all those things, your numbers look good. I made a video about this the other day in my group where you know numbers were good, lab work looks perfect, but the sexual stuff just isn't quite there. Then that's when you could potentially look at doing a trial of HCG because some guys just need HCG to feel their best and to function their best. I don't, the majority of my clients don't, but some guys do. And it's not really something we're going to see on the lab work. So you keep that in the back pocket if you do need it. But what you'd be doing at this stage is just do, do your initial blood test, see where your numbers are at, tweak your protocol as needed, and then just be patient with it and give it time. Yeah. Another question I had for you, Dave, uh, regarding the multivitamin. What other things or minimum doses must people be looking for uh, in those multivitamins if they can't order what you just recommended? So the sure. boron three milligrams, but what else yeah. must be in them? Yeah, so 
going from top to bottom. So I like vitamin A to be in the form of retinol, which will be retinol palmitate, uh, as opposed to beta carotene. So uh, vitamin A is inactive form. It's called beta carotene. It's a precursor. You get it from eating stuff like orange plants, like carrots and sweet potatoes. Uh, that is an enzyme dependent process to convert beta carotene into retinol. A lot of people genetically, particularly Northern European Caucasian people don't have that enzyme. I don't have that enzyme. So I don't get shit from beta carotene. So you want to make sure at least half of the vitamin A is in uh, retinol form. And then moving down the list, uh, vitamin E, you want to make sure that uh, preferably it's from a mixed source of vitamin E. So you'll find that down the bottom. It will, it will contain uh, various forms of vitamin E. And then in terms of vitamin D and vitamin K, a lot of the time vitamin K is excluded from multivitamins because it's expensive. Uh, and honestly, the life extension and the supplement needs don't contain vitamin K at all. Uh, supplement needs doesn't even contain any vitamin D. And that's because the levels included in multivitamins are often too low and you need to supplement with them separately. So the thorn uh, basic nutrients is a good cover oil. You get 2000 IU of vitamin D, and I believe you get about 80% of your RDA of vitamin K in there as well. But for most guys, I'd also recommend taking a 5,000 IU vitamin D supplement that's also supported with vitamin K, preferably from MK4 and K7. Uh, and with vitamin D, you want it to be vitamin D3, not D2, similar to the, to the vitamin A issue in active precursors. Then when you're getting into the B vitamin complexes, you want to make sure they're methylated. Uh, because non-methylated versions of B vitamins, you're just going to piss out. It's just going to make your urine fluor yellow. It's not going to do anything in your body. So you want to make sure that when you're looking at stuff like B12, you can see methyl in front of it. I, I, I can't pronounce the full methyl collocobalin or whatever it is. I'm not even going to try. Um, and then for B uh, folate, you want to make sure it's methyl folate as opposed to folic acid. A really good red flag for looking at a multivitamin is if it contains folic acid, it's junk, throw it in the bin. It means means they've skipped on one of the most important ingredients. You want to get methylfolate. Uh, vitamin B6 should be P5P form. Of course, very effective for reducing prolactin. And then as you're going down into the minerals, I like zinc to be included in at least like a 10 to 15 milligram dose. Uh, I believe the supplement needs is 25 and life extension, I think is as high as 30. Uh, and then with everything else in terms of your trace minerals, you want them to be present. But when it comes to stuff like magnesium, you're not going to be able to get your RDA of magnesium because it's got too high of a molecular weight. Uh, so as long as they're included in trace amounts, that's all you're looking for. But the main thing you're looking for is the methylated B vitamins and the bioavailable vitamin A. Uh, and then you want to add the vitamin D and vitamin K separately. Okay, right. So um, the questions, um, yeah. Said Larry, um, I don't want to take Lipitor. What supplement do you recommend for preventative maintenance for cholesterol? And is 81 milligram baby aspirin not good to take long term? Okay, yeah. so in terms of what's going on with the cholesterol, I mean, it really depends on what's going on because looking at HDL and LDL can often cause a lot of uh, stress and hypochondria where it's not really uh, warranted. Um, HD, I know that Justin has done some amazing videos on HDL and LDL explaining that, but, um, and he explains it very well. He uses a similar analogy, but, uh, you know, they're, they're transporters. They're like cars on the road. They're not really indicative of how much cholesterol is floating around the body. What we tend to do, not we, what, 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 uh, traditional Western medicine does is it points the finger at cholesterol for heart disease. Whereas what cholesterol is, is it's band-aiding up the issues in the arteries. So, what we need to be looking at is why is the body sending out so many band-aids and why are band-aids building up and clogging the arteries? The body is doing it for a reason. These are all demand-driven processes. So what you want to look at is look at triglycerides. Uh, that for me is a really good measure of inflammation, triglycerides and C-reactive protein. If they're both low, I really wouldn't give it too much concern. If you are worried about uh, cholesterol, my preferred uh, cholesterol supplement is again from Supplement Needs. Uh, it's called CV uh, and it's like a, it's got like a blend of like uh, red yeast rice extract, curcumin, a few other things in there that work very well in synergy. Uh, but you, you definitely, I'm not in my, in my I, I'm not a fan of Lipitor. So, but that's again, something you want to discuss with your doctor. 
In terms of long dose, but like long term low dose aspirin, like the 81 milligram baby aspirin, I think there are a lot of benefits to supplementing with aspirin, depending on who you talk to. Uh, if you want to look into aspirin, I know, I know Ray Pete's done a lot of work on low dose aspirin. I don't personally use it, but I would prefer to use low dose aspirin uh, over something like Lipitor for sure. Okay, that's interesting. Most of the issues with aspirin come from inflammation of the stomach lining, and that's when you're getting into like much higher dosing. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, very general question. We already answered several times before on this channel, but maybe a uh, short. Uh, typically, at what level of TRT will you need to start giving blood to keep it thin? I know the answer to that. <laughs> a gram a week, a thousand milligrams a week, you should probably donate blood. Uh, look, in terms of if you're keeping it within physiological parameters, there's no need to donate blood. Um, the way that I look at it, I mean, I have a very blunt approach to this. I say that if you need to bleed a pint of blood at a regular occurrence, there's something wrong. Uh, there's, there is no way that optimal male physiology requires regular clockwork bleeding, uh, particularly bleeding that much. It's, it, it's not needed. And if it was, uh, there's something very screwed up with our biology. So, uh, it's not needed. If, if you're running super physiological doses and which you know you shouldn't be doing, but it, it, it's a completely different discussion. So you don't need to do therapeutic phlebotomies on TRT. It's not needed. It, it never has been and it never will be. Uh, if your hematocrit is elevated, I would be looking at, well, look at the reference range first because I've seen hematocrit go up to on the reference range uh, 0.50. I've also seen it go up to 0.56. Uh, which is a big difference. So a lot of the time people will be freaking out just because they've got a low hematocrit reference range. They'll see that it's above range and they'll worry. They'll jump on Dr. Google and it will say, you know, your blood's too thick. You're going to have a heart attack. Go donate blood. You don't need to do that. Uh, hematocrit is often a measure of hydration. So what I tend to do when guys come in ahead, you're higher than they're comfortable with, I just say, look, do another blood test next week, but drink like a liter or two, drink a liter of water before you go get your blood work done. And the hematocrit always comes back down and, and everyone's happy and the anxiety is gone. What I've found is that high hematocrit, the main issue with it is anxiety uh, based off Googling symptoms. You don't need to, you, you, you don't, you do not need to donate blood uh, on TRT. It's not needed. Yeah, exactly. So uh, one last thing I got from uh, Messenger uh, or I um, gathered somewhere. Um, does testosterone increase height? I don't know where that question comes from, but I see it regularly on uh, as a YouTube search term. Yeah, I've, I've seen this. I read the study on this because it's a similar thing to when uh, people say, will testosterone increase penis size? Um, and there are studies on this where they've given uh, people testosterone, but it's when they're still growing. Uh, yeah. So they found that if, if, you, if you are hypogonadal during the stage you're growing, and then you, you correct your testosterone, yes, you will grow. Uh, same with, uh, same with the, the study on penis size, when people found that they, uh, for people who had micro penises who had hypogonadism, when they corrected testosterone levels uh, and they applied it topically, it made it grow. But it doesn't mean that the average person is going to get a bigger dick or is going to get taller when they go on testosterone. It's only if you're fixing a deficiency at the right time in the right way. So I would not assume that someone who's a fully developed adult, when they go on TRT and optimize the physiological parameters would grow. If you do, that would be awesome. Please let us know. Uh, but no, I, I wouldn't be assuming that that would be something that we'd be saying. After teenage years, I guess, when the grow plates are closed down, can't do anything more about it. Maybe looking at it like kind of more like holistically and psychologically, like if someone's been hypogonadal and then you correct their testosterone and their confidence improves, they may stand up straighter, they may elongate their spine a bit more, and that may make them taller in terms of their measurements, but that would just be a postural correction, correctional thing from, you know, having improved confidence. So, yeah. Ali says, I wish it increased the height. <laughs> um, uh, what do people mean when they say good pumps in the gym in regards to low dose daily Tadalafil? 
Yeah, so tenolophil is a PDE5 inhibitor, which will basically increase levels of nitric oxide in the blood. Um, and this does happen systemically. So when you have more nitric oxide in the blood, uh, you will get, uh, you know, you tend to get more vascular, you can tend to get more pumps in the, in the, in the muscles. I've honestly found that it does make a little bit of a difference, but nothing that would be like, oh, I'm going to take five milligrams of tadalafil before my workout to get a better pump. I found that Viagra does work more effectively for this. And I would say that using maybe 20 milligrams or even 40 milligrams of tadalafil would be more effective, but using L-citrulline is going to give you way better results if you are chasing a pump. Now, using them in conjunction with each other, so L-citrulline being a nitric oxide precursor and then tadalafil uh, decreasing the breakdown of nitric oxide, that is kind of the best way to hit it from both angles. But like six to 12 milligrams of L-citrulline, not citrulline malate, L-citrulline uh, would, would be a very effective way to increase pumps at the gym. And then, yeah, combining it with, you know, 2.5 to 5 milligrams of tadalafil would make a difference, but I wouldn't be expecting any amazing kind of pump results. You'd be getting a better result from like a well-formulated pump product. Mm -hmm. And do you recommend low dose, like 5 milligrams tadalafil for the other health benefits? I've been using low dose tadalafil probably for like two and a half years now. Uh, most of my clients would be using it. Uh, I'd say about 70% of my guys would be using daily tadalafil. Um, Yeah, I think it's great. I think it has some really nice anti-inflammatory effects in the body. Um, I often see C-reactive protein come down a little bit. Uh, and I think the, the bedroom performance benefits are also nothing to be understated. I think that they're also really nice in addition. But I think in terms of like today, I feel is one of the very few pharmaceutical products I'm a fan of. Uh, and I think it is a health promoting agent in men. Uh, and yeah, I think if If you want to add something extra to TRT, I don't think anyone needs, well, some guys need it for sexual performance, but in general, you know, you don't need to take five milligrams of Tadalafil a day, but if you want to take something extra to, you know, improve your performance, improve your health in that realm of pharmaceuticals, I think five milligrams of Tadalafil is a great option. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I've been using it for, yeah, I guess two to three years uh, as well. Yeah. Um, Yeah, for all these uh, several health options, uh, as Gil recommended before on the channel. So um, we're uh, reaching the one hour mark. So uh, let's wrap things up. Uh, maybe one more question there. Uh, do sure. people with low SHBG respond better to fast acting forms of tests like propionate or scrotal creams in your experience, Dave? I haven't found that to be a factor, to be honest. Um, I found that the, the SHBG can often be a little bit of a red herring for a lot of people. I've seen a lot of people get really caught up with their SHBG. Um, and the way that I look at it, and, and this is what I see happen a lot in terms of people uh, self-diagnosing and self-medicating is they'll run a very limited blood panel, they'll feel that crap, and then they'll find the one marker that's off in that panel and point the finger at that. Whereas in reality, there's a whole bunch of other markers that these people haven't checked, which are more likely going to be causing the issue. And SHBG is a really easy one to get fixated on because it affects your free testosterone. And that's obviously very important psychologically to a lot of people in terms of self-diagnosing. The thing is that SHBG impacts the half-life of uh, free testosterone and, and testosterone in the body, but it doesn't impact the speed in which the ester is cleaved so that the testosterone is cleaved from the ester. So I found that the only thing that I look at SHBG for in terms of the binding proteins, both SHBG and albumin, is how much total testosterone you need to optimize free testosterone. I have seen guys with low SHBG do great with infrequent injections. I've seen guys with high SHBG who need to do daily, daily injections to feel good. I found that a lot of the time, SHBG is definitely a factor in this, and it's definitely correlated, and it definitely makes a difference. But I've also found that sometimes it can be unrelated. So I think when we're looking at SHBG, we should be looking at it to primarily determine how much testosterone we're going to need to get a good free testosterone level to optimize symptom resolution. But in terms of using stuff like propionate, scrotal cream, ananthate, cypionate, sustenon, it's going to come down to your individual experience. And it's we can't really determine what what is... Uh, how quickly you're going to be cleaving the ester off the testosterone, how quickly you're going to be metabolizing it. There are so many factors that we just can't look at on blood work. 
and that's going to come down to the individual. I mean, my SHBG is like 40, uh, and I definitely do better with more frequent injections. Okay, Dave, thank you so much for this talk. It was very interesting. Thank you, viewers, for uh, watching, giving, for giving this video a thumbs up. And before we end, Dave, how can people reach you if they would want to? Yeah, absolutely. So my website is advancedfundamentalhealth.com. Uh, you can book in with me uh, through that website. And I've also got a contact form on there, which goes straight to my email. Uh, however, if you would like to email me directly, uh, if you want to send attachments, it's dave at advancedfundamentalhealth.com. Uh, otherwise, you can just tag me in comments in the TRT and hormone optimization group, and I can help you out through that. Great. Thank you so much, Dave. I will put your links, your uh, referrals uh, in the description of this video. No worries. All right, Thank then. You. Thank you, Stephen. So I wish everyone a 